My name's Esther Sayers, and I'm going to chair this session. You're going to hear from four artists during this next um, block. Each of the artists in this group explores mechanisms by which culture exerts social control over them in some ways. And each of these artists draws on personal experience when they're making their work. They all think in different ways about feminist perspectives on sexual identity. But during this session, don't expect to get answers or statements from the artwork that you hear about. The purpose of the art in, that you're going to hear about now is about raising questions, it's about making propositions, it's about provoking responses, making provocations. It's not about finding solutions. So put on your questioning brain and um, enjoy what the artists have got to say. I'm going to start with Ritty Taxum, who I'd like to invite to tell us a bit about the background to your work, Ricky. I'm starting with a little introduction about my background, where I'm coming from. I think it's important for me to explain this before I explain my work. I think the background was the important thing that led me to doing what I do now. Growing up, I uh, always had this... I was... How did I'm starting to... Growing up, I've had a lot of questions about my sexuality, especially at a young age. Um, and when I was growing up, I've... I had no one basically to talk to about all these questions that I have. Basically because uh, I live in a very Catholic island, which is Malta. And also because uh, at the time when I was, how to say, discovering myself, my family was going through like a very bad time. So it was like I was keeping all these questions to myself and, for example, basic questions. I mean why am I a girl and uh, likes girls, for example. And th this was just when I was about eight or nine. So growing up, accumulating all these questions, I think, has led me to what I am doing now. So throughout the years, I try to find different channels through which I can, um, how, through which I can show all these inner feelings. And it's only a few years ago that I discovered that Photography was the channel through which I needed to explain what I was feeling, basically. I mean, I, I couldn't draw because I'm very bad at it. So it had to be something that I, it could really explain what I, what I feel. And in Malta, nowadays, although it's still like not the, they're not really open-minded, they're slowly accepting different ideas of uh, sexual orientation, sexual, sexuality in general. However, still it's, it's still like a, not, not a taboo subject, but there's more to be done for people to be accepting, I think. So the work I do is more like questioning and uh, more of them it's, it shows gender ambiguity which I think I find myself drawn to it, but only recently. I never thought I would, be, I would end up doing these kinds of works, but after, now I've been doing this for three years, and you see it's a certain pattern. And during the years, you start see, seeing the resemblance from one work to the other. And especially my work, I tend to cover the people's face. And uh, it, I never knew that why, I never did it intentionally to cover their face, but it was also like a self-projection. Because when I take photos of people, I, I don't want to see the face, because some, some more often than not, it's like a projection of the self. I see myself in those images. Thank you, Ritty, um, for the introduction to your work. For those of you who um, have been around the show. Ritty's work is on the top corridor upstairs. It's the photographic works that appear on the corridor um, on the left-hand side as you come in this way. 
Pretty all of the works that you've got in this show are photographic, um, but I'm interested in the process that you use to make the work. Is it digital? Is it analog? How do you make it? It's a mixture of both. I use both film and analog photography. Mm -hmm. I don't think there is an actual process on how I create the images. I mean, I don't have a particular image in mind and then I create it. I choose the model and then I take the model somewhere and it's also like getting to know the model and exchanging ideas. It almost becomes like a conversation with the model. And then I take the shots and from a thousand I choose maybe two or three. And then it, I, I choose one from the three images. And then I start working on it and more often than not it becomes like a layered image on top of each other representing uh, gender, uh, the queer body, like the one we're seeing here, for example. It's a mixture of, uh, it's a le for example, this image it has parts of different human bodies, not just a male or a female, it, it's a mixture of, of the two. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And are they superimposed? Yeah, on exactly, on like layers on top of each other. Usually, I, when I do it with film, you can do it manually, but with digital photography, you have to do it on Photoshop, for example. Mm -hmm. It's a, mm -hmm. I don't really explain the technique very well because... And do you use a digital camera or do you work on film? I use digital, but now I'm trying to go more on film because I love the effect and the texture it, it, it gives. Mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. It has a particular feeling and it creates more of a mood than the digital imagery. Mm -hmm. And we just saw the image with the sheet around the head okay. and the faces are always obscured. Yeah. Why do you do that? As I, I think I said before, it's, mm -hmm. a, it's more a projection of the self mm -hmm. in, in the sense when I see the images I wouldn't want to see the proper face of the models because it's like I see myself in them. So. To see someone else's face would be like, no, no, I, don't, I, I wouldn't want that. So it's not about their identity. It's not an exploration of their identity. Exactly. It's, a, it's my identity, mm -hmm. I think. But mm -hmm. I wouldn't perform myself in my images. Mm -hmm. I don't feel I can... I'm very shy to stay in front of the camera, I think. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and this series of work is called Shell. Yeah, can exactly. Can you tell us why you called it Shell? It's called Shell because it represents the outer skin of the human body and uh, more often than not it shows less than it contains inside as a shell with c certain organisms. So I, I think it fits perfectly with the images because here you can only see a body but inside you, there is more to it. For example, there's m how I say it, there's more to it, to it than meets the eye. Mm -hmm. And previously you made a piece of work called Four Rooms? Yeah, it was an exhibition. My recent solo show okay. was called Four Rooms. And it uh, specifically tar was about human rela relationships and how one gets to know another through different rooms in our life. Mm -hmm. And it was called skin, body, mind and heart. And people had to actually go through the rooms until finally getting into the heart. Which meant that the first room is only for appearances and it's a fragile facade. And there's, there are other rooms which you need to explore before, for example, judging someone. Mm -hmm. So, in a similar way, this series is called Shell, and it's about exactly, the, the outer, outer shell. Yeah, exactly. yeah. There seems to be a big similarity between these two. Yeah, I, I f I'm finding myself more drawn to this kind of topic. Mm. I think uh, I'm fascinated with what we show on the outside and what we have on mm. the inside. Mm -hmm. In terms of education, Ritty, did you go to art college? I went for three months. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I found it uh, very difficult mm -hmm. to continue because I, I don't like working with deadlines and that especially where I, go, where I was going to at Hemcast in Malta, mm -hmm. they f force you to create an artwork in maybe three days and I think it, there is more, you ne I, I, I myself need more time to create an artwork than just with a deadline for three days and you get a good grade. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think it was a bit stifling the creativity. Mm. 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 I'm really interested in the fact that your making process takes time and it didn't fit. You felt stifled as an artist exactly. by the systems of education around exactly. art. Exactly. 
I would prefer learning things that are not related to art and explore themes, for example, on gender, mm -hmm. and then ch ex explore them myself as an artist through my views. Not, mm -hmm. I don't want others to impose. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's very difficult to explain when I just want to be able to create my own thing and not being forced to follow any deadlines or being tested on what I do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think many artists end up being self-taught in one way or another because you find your own path. Exactly. Y y you ask questions of yourself constantly. Exactly. And I think, for example, in the course I was doing, a lot of end up doing the same thing mm -hmm. because I think the teachers end up forcing their own ideas onto them, mm -hmm. which I, I, I think I didn't want to be part of mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. It leaves you isolated in a way. Do you have a community of artists in Malta that you work with? How does it work there? I, th I think I find my, I communicate with the models a lot. Mm -hmm. I think I, I choose the models myself, so I choose them with a particular, I, I, I don't know, with a particular background and then we work together and we communicate. So I find my communication in these people. Mm -hmm. And we, we almost, more often than not, we end up being friends rather than a working relationship. Right, interesting. And so you don't know them before you start sometimes? You, you, you Usually, before, when I started, I knew that they were mostly my friends, but then I started generating more interest in the works and people were sending me like their photos to take mm. images of them and I started getting you know, to know more people. Yes, I can imagine that these relationships will continue. Yes, um, exactly. In fact, okay. some of them I use them more than once, especially for new shots in Malta. No, not a lot of people would like to be, to expose their body to strangers, for example. But, so, so I end up using maybe the same model more than once. Mm. Mm, fantastic. Um, and what's next? Do you know? I think next is a break. All right. Because <laughs> I've been working on the previous solo show and this, and I think now I, I would like to just sit and read and maybe explore more things on my own. Mm -hmm. It seems to me from what you've talked about that that's the way that your creative process works, yeah, exactly. that it's a reflective process. Exactly, and I think in the past few months I didn't have a lot of time to actually work on something specific. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Well, I look forward to the next instalment of Ritty Tuxen work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ritty. Okay. Hi, yes. Um, as you can see, I'm uh, something of a trans person. And um, I perform as a woman in my work in large format photographs. This is the very first piece that I ever made performing as a woman. I only started that when I was very old actually. I'd been making prints for 20 years, etchings and screen prints and lithographs, but this was the beginning of a new phase of work uh, made in 1998. In the exhibition here there are others which are still no more than portraits really. Um, they're a way of testing, a way of checking. Uh, every now and then I make some experimental portraits just to see how far I can push the feminine persona, uh, to what extent I can perform it, and what I might be able to say by doing it. Uh, so this one was taken eight years after the first one, and the other one that's upstairs was taken six years after the last one. But they are just simple tests of projecting a female persona. I, um, I actually stopped just thinking about myself when I started to make this work quite quickly and became interested in art history. And particularly looking at aspects of art history from a feminist point of view, and looking particularly about how women have been represented traditionally. Um, because the more you look at history, particularly the history of Western art, um, the majority of artists are men, and the majority of the rules that are invented around the art that was made by those men have also been made by men. So I, I've made a number of pieces which, which are about women who break the rules, uh, 
in, from mythological stories or from history. This is a, a 19th century painting by an artist called John Waterhouse and it, it's about the legend of Pandora who was forbidden to open the golden box otherwise she would uh, let out all the evils of the world. So good old Pandora, she opens the golden box. This is my Pandora. <laughs> She's opened the golden box and she's shredding men's suits and feeding them to the piranhas. Here's another poor woman who is stitched up really in, uh, in a tangle of rules made by men. It's, um, she's called the Lady of Shalott. It's based on a very famous poem by an English poet of the 19th century. Uh, and the story goes that a spell was cast upon her. She was imprisoned in a tower. She couldn't look directly out of the window. She had to look in the mirror that you see behind her. There. It was her only view of the world. And meanwhile, she had to continue with her weaving. Um, finally, she couldn't resist looking out the window to look at the man she loved and so the mirror broke and she was tangled up, the spell was cast and she was tangled up in her weaving. There's my shallot. She's not weaving but she's still surrounded by what we might argue is male dominated technology but um, you'll know she's just about to cut herself free with a big pair of dressmakers scissors. I also like to play in, in, in my work based on historical things with aspects of gender representation. And I was working with uh, a very traditional art gallery in, in England where they have historical collection of painting and sculptures. And in their collection I found this wonderful Roman sculpture of a hermaphrodite. Um, and obviously discovering a sculpture uh, of, of someone who has uh, genitalia or other, other physical features of both sexes was of some interest to me. So I decided that I'd make a response to this. But I actually based my response on another historical painting which is this one from the 1890s by a very famous English painter called Frederick Leighton. Um, uh, so I, I chose to adopt this pose to uh, make my response to the hermaphrodite. Um, so there's mine. You can't really see on the scale it's projected here, but um, it, it was a very, very large piece. The two figures were almost life size on this. And when you see them that size, you could notice that whilst the top figure gives you some information about the body. The lower figure gives you some more explicit information about the body. And this was installed in this very traditional museum uh, in between these grand columns uh, and with rather a lot of ancient sculptures of male genitalia uh, in the room. So in that way, I've played in various ways with ideas of gender and ideas of how women have been represented. And I'm still really continuing with that theme at the moment. Um, the, there is a long tradition in Western painting of, of paintings called Judgment of Paris or sometimes um, Three Graces. Um, but all of these are about three lovely, naked women uh, on display to be judged by a man called Paris. It's a story from mythology, yet another story from mythology. Um, this is a very, this goes back to almost the beginnings of this, it's a 15th century painting by German artist Lucas Cranach, but it gives you idea of the three naked women on display. Here's another from a similar period, slightly later, Italian Renaissance, Botticelli, three, nearly naked. And always young and always eroticized by the male artist. So I've been working just recently with a group of older women who are performing with me. And so we old ladies are um, 
reproducing our version of what, uh, what what's embedded in centuries of history of this tradition of paintings we're not including the figure of the male figure of Paris making a judgment about us as if we're some kind of beauty contest um, we're leaving it to you the viewer to make your judgments about these three old ladies um, having great pride in their bodies and this uh, the reason for these is simply they are a celebration of the mature body and they're not a surrender to the male gaze there's another one this time from the 19th century and now our nearly naked young ladies are almost framed in a box for you to view so upstairs in the exhibition you'll see this one and again it's the older ladies but they gaze back at you the viewer you make your judgments but we're looking at you we're challenging you to um, make your opinion about our older bodies some of which you can see have even been disfigured by the trauma the psychological and the physical trauma of breast cancer but we're, we're nevertheless proud we gaze back at you there's another interesting aspect of history that i discovered um, when you look at Western painting in particular, in the middle of the 19th century, um, women were usually depicted as completely passive, passive objects to be looked at, never doing anything of any particular significance. And then, towards the end of the century, as the women's movement gained um, momentum uh, and, and women moved towards greater empowerment, which eventually led to the vote um, suddenly male artists started to picture them as predatory goddesses um, or sirens w w threatening women that threatened men so that's quite a trend and I've had a go at that as well in the past but I've discovered another trend at about the same time where male artists start to depict women as lesbians and again it seems to be a reaction to their gaining power their gaining autonomy that if you depict them as lesbians then presumably their preoccupation with each other gives license for the male gaze so with my older ladies I, I, I'm interested in playing with this particular phenomenon with mine again it's an invitation to you the viewer you just invite it to question the relationship between these women question their performance of femininity sexuality and joy even at their age but actually all is not joy because this particular person as uh, you saw in an earlier image just now uh, was unfortunate to suffer from breast cancer and have the necessary surgery and so here is another less joyful aspect of exploring the older body and presenting the older body not for the sexual titillation of the viewer but simply as a presentation this is reality yet it's a reality to be proud of this is part of the body of work um, that I've been making which I, I've, I've called the entire body of work agony and ecstasy because uh, in, in, in many ways through our sense of how we present ourselves how we construct ourselves how we place ourselves with other peoples in terms of our sexuality or our gender or our performance of it um, there is agony and there is ecstasy um, so I've, um, I've been exploring this yep. 
just got things in the wrong order here. Um, they've been in, influenced a lot, these agony and ecstasy things, by some paintings by a Brazilian artist friend of mine um, who has made paintings over the years very private, very intimate, very introverted paintings uh, about abuse that she has suffered earlier in her life and making the paintings has been a, a way of coming to terms with this. This is one of her paintings and you can see how it's influenced the figure on the left which is me and this piece that you can see upstairs uh, and the other person is the Brazilian artist herself, the one uh, who threatens me there a little bit. But th this Agony and Ecstasy series uh, enters a, a kind of territory of sensuality, tragedy, pleasure and pain. This is another of her paintings where you have the two figures, one clearly tormenting the other with a whip and pissing on them. And we have continued to explore the ideas that are in these paintings. This work, in some of this work, I've become conscious of trying to explore the idea of being a victim. And that's partly something to do with my own psychology. It's partly to do with the way that I was treated as a child, the way that I was brought up, the way that I felt I was conditioned by society when I, when, when I was a child. Um, so th th there is some sense of, of, of being a victim. But I also found in, in my researches for some of this work uh, a most interesting theory by an American uh, theorist called Stephen Eisenham who wrote a book called The Abu Ghraib Effect. And I don't know whether Abu Ghraib has any resonance for you, but it, it's the prison in Iraq that was run by the American military um, during the mo most recent Iraq war. And in 2003, a series of deeply shocking photographs were, were, were published worldwide of US military personnel persecuting Iraqi prisoners in there. And Eisenham makes the point that we as societies are not as shocked and appalled by that, those sorts of images as perhaps we should be because there is a long, long tradition that goes right back for hundreds of years as far back as ancient Greece um, of images of cruelty, image expressions of one agency exerting their power over another. And over the years as that tradition has developed, there's become a, 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 an interesting thing where um, the, there is almost a celebration of the pain inflicted as if the person who is being subjugated by the superior power is supposedly enjoying their, their chastisement. So I became most interested in this theory and looked, here are some typical examples of the images. Here we go right back to the Italian Renaissance again, the figure of Saint Sebastian, there are very, very many paintings like this, uh, shot to death with arrows, um, this goes back to ancient Rome because he became a Christian. Uh, but these are also considered well, uh, extremely homoerotic images. So you get this strange mixture of pleasure and pain, agony and ecstasy in these. This is interesting. This is a drawing by, by Spanish artist Francesco Goya uh, from, from the 19th century. Um, and it is so remarkably similar to one of the photographs from the Abu Ghraib prison of the way that these people were hu humiliated by their military supervisors. So these have been something of an influence for me. And, and for me, um, 
it's interesting to try to express somehow this, this space or this limbo, this in-between space between agony and ecstasy, between sort of physical chastisement and, and, and spiritual redemption. There's a very large piece that you may have seen upstairs, um, which is, there are elements of suffering in it, but it's less about suffering and uh, more about sexuality. And certainly a lot of it is about being in between. This piece also was performed with the Brazilian artist Monica Groman and influenced by her paintings. Here's another one of her paintings where gender becomes complicated, there is a clearly a power relationship going on, but there are clearly sexual signifiers as well. So it becomes a very complex image to read, I think. And there's another one. Also influenced, and the title of the piece upstairs is homage to uh, Pierre Molinier, um, because we were rather influenced by the work of Molinier, French artist, working in the 1960s, like me, projecting himself as, in a, in a, as, a, as a female persona in his work. These were photo montages made in the 60s before the days of Photoshop. Um, but, but he performs and then makes these composite images and they, to some extent, influence the style of our piece. So the piece upstairs is, is constructed as a performance, a performance of sexuality, where gender, sexuality, Agony and ecstasy are all in a state of dynamic flux. It seems to speak, well I hope it speaks more about what sexuality is than simply the word itself. Brilliant. I'm, a, I'm allowed to have a set, do a second bit now. <laughs> I've, I've really just tried to give you some insights into the pieces that are in this exhibition. Um, the themes that I've mentioned, that, that are embedded in those works, go back quite a lot longer in, in the work that I've made. Going back to, to making pieces that are responses to traditional um, art forms, mainly from the 19th century uh, in, in, in England or in Europe. Um, I mentioned this tradition in the mid-19th century of women being um, shown as passive objects, sometimes very passive, terminally passive. Um, this, this is again from the Lady of Shalott story that she ends up dead in a boat. This is a photograph from the middle of the, the 19th century by Henry Peach Robinson. Another very famous painting from slightly later um, by John Everett Millet of Ophelia. I don't know if you're familiar with, with Shakespeare's play Hamlet, but Ophelia is a character in this who uh, is driven mad uh, and, and, and finally um, ends up dead in the water. This is a piece made in response to it by myself and Ricky, who's here to speak to you next. Uh, this is the two of us uh, working and collaborating together to produce this piece. This is yet another famous English painting by a painter called Sir Lawrence Alma Tadema um, of yet another young, eroticized young lady on display. As my version. You'll see that my shameless girl has dropped her fan that was... Uh, has is uh, hiding herself coyly with it, but uh, mine's dropped it. And uh, perhaps the banana suggests something else that she may be thinking about. But sometimes, not everyone likes my work. These are some comments written in a, a visitor's book at the gallery where these works 
and the Victorian, the 19th century originals were displayed. So, very, very strong responses from some people. I hope the translators are able to help you with this. <laughs> <if you. laughs> and the interesting thing is, about these that um, it, it's not what I'm trying to say from a feminist perspective about the traditions that are embedded in art, in literature, in mythology. What seems to upset these people so much is the trans bit, the man, woman, in between bit. So I am. Um, I did something with those texts actually. Um, here's another Victorian painting, and this is late Victorian, so this is where the images of women began to turn into those predatory ones who threaten men. This is uh, a goddess, the, tr the tradition going right back to ancient Greece is that the goddess Circe could transform men into pigs. Well, I wanted to make a version of this. And it occurred to me that I had proved that I could turn gallery viewers into ignorant swine. So I made a frame for it, well I borrowed a frame from the gallery, um, but inside the frame I put an extra piece you can see there and had all of those pieces of writing that you've been reading um, engraved into the frame. So in a way, I kind of transformed those people who were critical of my work. But receiving those kind of comments made me go on to make some other work, which was specifically about people making judgments about my transgender performance. So here again is another 19th century piece um, by John, painter John Waterhouse. This one's called The Magic Circle. It's just this strange woman drawing a circle of fire on the ground around a burning cauldron. That's my version, but I've got an audience. An audience looking slightly perplexed and concerned and not sure what they think, what their responses are to this transgender performance. And then there's another um, painting by, by the same artist, John Waterhouse, uh, uh, of a person called Mariamne. This goes back to um, Christian history. She was the wife of uh, King Herod, who features in early Christian history, and she was wrongly accused of adultery and put to death. So that's my version. And on this occasion, I, I deliberately chose to have a group of judges making their judgment about my performance of different ages, but different ethnicities too, on the grounds that um, different cultures have different views about sexual orientation, about gender performance, etc. And it's one of the reasons that I'm absolutely delighted to be here um, to test my work with an audience from a different culture. And, and I look forward to uh, finding out some of those responses. Uh, I also wonder um, what some of those people who wrote the very critical things would have said about the newer work that I have upstairs. But we'll see. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. <laughs> I wanted to address my question to Peel. Um, I wanted to say that um, I came to meet your work like a couple of weeks ago, before I came into the exhibition, and I was really interested by it. It was, it was really, I really liked it, and being like, um, and I was also really happy like today when I was hearing you, because like uh, being new to all the, the how to read an image and, and, and that kind of things. I was like pretty accurate of some of the things that I, that I, that I could read uh, on your on your on your work, and it's like for me it's it's really really nice when when I feel when I see a work that the artist is talking to me 
through the through the piece rather than me projecting myself on the on, on the image. Um, but my question uh, is, is regarding your process. Um, um, having met uh, before in my life, like I had a, a, a transgender uh, friend. Uh, for her, 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 her thing was like trying to to find the means to make her body co her body correspond to what she felt inside. Uh, she, she was because she wasn't comfortable on that body she was born with. Um, and as you said before, um, this process of transformation for you began uh, not 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 so far ago, and. Um, and, it, and I, like it seemed like uh, you as an artist like um, got a, a growing interest on, on explaining this feminism and, and, and ideas, and then like uh, the, the art, your art to cover your body in some sort of way, uh, and it's not like uh, you as a person trying to find your identity as a woman, but you as an artist letting your art uh, transform your body to say something. Uh, so I wanted just to, to to ask you about how that experience was or. Or what does it mean? Thank, thanks. Uh, yeah, you touch on an interesting thing. It's um, th th this is not a deeply analytical answer. I'll give you it. it it's an anecdote from my life, really. Um, that uh, as a person as opposed to an artist, um, I decided uh, gradually over a period of some time that, that um, well, I wish to consider myself as a woman. Um, I, I find in all of this territory actually language is very difficult um, because uh, as soon as I say that, you know, I began to think of myself as a woman. It's another way of saying other, uh, which we've already touched on. Um, it's not quite what I mean, but but as a result of uh, the things that happen in life, like being a parent, by nurturing children, uh, by cooking meals or, or, or being responsible for domestic tasks uh, and so on. Well, it, it, one's sense of what gender roles are uh, and what maleness is and what femaleness begin to erode, they begin to dissolve. And, and so that process went on over a period of time, which made me begin to think that um, the kind of behavior that I wanted was, was that associated with women. Um, so this was a transition happening in my life. And part of that was what I wanted to look like as well. Um, interestingly, um, as that process was going on, um, I didn't have the courage really to do it in a flash like that. But what I did do at a critical point was turn it into art. And that very first image that I showed you was done, w w was the first step in doing that. But, and this sounds like a paradox, I chose to put that persona into the public domain as art before I actually had the courage or I suspect the skill <laughs> To, to, to actually perform it to the same degree in real life. So, I, it, in a way, I used making art, you, using myself as a subject in the art, I used that as a challenge to myself as a person to follow it and catch up with it. As I told you, you were going to get a personal anecdote. Does it in any way answer your question? It, I might just come in on that because you may have noticed Phil and I have the same surname and he's actually my father and so at that point when that image was being made I was the newly graduated art student with a camera who took the photograph and it was a very important part of the process I think that it could stay within the realms of the family that at that point this wasn't as Phil's just said a moment to become public but it was a moment to become public with Phil's family. So in a sense, as his daughter, I was integrated into this process of change by being involved in the art making, by playing a role and being supportive. And so 
it, it, you know, the art and the life seem to be enmeshed together in, in the process of making the work. Our secret is out. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Yeah, okay. Uh, hello. Um, the question is for Mr. Sayers. Like, um, you showed a lot of uh, images from John Water House, and I was wondering, like, uh, um, all the paintings that he um, he had drawn about women are very feminine. And have you thought about like uh, um, Gustav Clement? And uh, um, yeah, and also like, um, um, how do you perceive like tomboy? Um, like, um, uh, um, like is it? I think it's probably harder for men to act like a tomboy since. Um, She's a girl, and she tries, and she sort of acts like a, a boy. You mentioned Waterhouse, and and then you know the possibility of working with another artist like Gustav Klimt. Um, the most of the artists that I've worked with, making pieces in response to, and sometimes making them with Ricky here, um, has been dictated as partly by what those paintings are saying in terms of the way women have been represented uh, etc which I've mentioned but also we, we have done a series of exhibitions with big national museums in England where they have historical collections and um, part of that contract with those has been to respond to things that are in their collections so that's determined the artist to some extent. We know the kind of thematics that we want to work with, the kind of things that, that, that I've been talking about. But, uh, you know, if I'm working with a particular gallery, then I have to see what's in their collection and find the things that are most appropriate to what I want to speak about, whoever the artist is. Now, it just happened that one of the galleries that we worked with had the John Waterhouse Lady of a lot in their collection um, we, and so I responded to it and, and the, the one of the goddess Circe came the same way and then as a result of doing those the curators of a big major national John War well international John Waterhouse show it was a retrospective that went to Holland to London and, and to Canada um, they contacted me uh, and were interested in what I was doing. So I then made more works about Waterhouse. So in fact, th that's driven pragmatically by just being active as an artist rather than any particular selection of, 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 of a, a particular artist for what they're doing. In, term, but, yeah, in terms of Klimt or anybody else, you, you're quite right, as I've tried to say, there are a number of thematics which I keep returning to because I don't think the job's done. I think there's still an awful lot that can be said about some of these issues. And so there are many, many artists that I'd like to work with. Um, and, and Klimt and, and all that period of secessionists and things is, is another interesting period in terms of what was happening politically and culturally within that. Um, I suppose I can conclude that by just saying, life's too short. <laughs> I'm going to pass you over to Ritty now because I think perhaps she can speak to your question about the tomboy. Um, what I was trying to say is that uh, um, the two other artists are um, showing pictures and or videos that are um, of uh, an, of an, another um, person, like another uh, with opposite gender. But uh, they, um, I, I just wonder, like, um, was it because it it was easier just to act um, as a feminine uh, woman? Rather than like being a, a a tomboy, like where a tomboy is in the in the middle, uh, between, in between. And with your work, you go. It's ambiguous. It's yeah, exactly. I don't 
really portray either a feminine side or a masculine side. I think most of my work are a, a mixture of the two together. In fact, some of them, that's why, are layered on top of each other. I don't necessarily portray a body of a, f a female body or a male, so I don't think that applies to me, in a sense. <laughs> I've never been a tomboy, um, e even though I did live about 40 years of my life um, attempting to perform masculinity, uh, and I am still a biological male, but um, I don't think I've ever been a tomboy. So, in fact, uh, your, your question almost qualifies my earlier comment, that for me the transition into simply adopting a more female persona was not a great step over the great divide into the other as far as I'm concerned. It, it seemed actually to be a natural progression of, of my temperament. Um, but the, bringing us back to the theme of the show, there's a very, very strong element of desire was driving that. Okay. I think um in, in, in many ways, something that's coming up through that is that perhaps biological women get to perform different gendered identities in a slightly more flexible and fluid way than the biological male is seen culturally as a much more culturally specific individual who has less opportunity to try out different things. It was easy for me to be a tomboy growing up because you kind of could and you can get away with it. Much more difficult for a boy to do that the other way around. I think on this note, given the time I've had the card, then um, we need to draw it to a close but please continue these conversations with the artists um, in the break. Thank you very much. Thank you.